All over the world, men and women fight for the protection of nature reserves and endangered species. Lynx, once extinct in many parts of Europe, now return thanks to conservationists. The manatees in Florida found strong allies, as well as Scandinavia's moose. Working with such a beautiful animal, that's almost a blessing. And without the help of conservationists, gorillas might have disappeared forever. South America's tropical rainforest is teeming with wildlife. One creature is possibly the most elusive in the world, the jaguar. Over the past 20 years, numbers have reduced by more than 20%. High time for a team of scientists, led by biologist Rodrigo Donati, to find out as much as possible about the big cat. But first, they need to catch a jaguar. They have checked their traps regularly, which means long journeys and little rest. This time, they get lucky. A female has been caught by one of their traps. For the cat, it's a stressful situation. Rodrigo must quickly tranquilize it. The drug takes effect in seconds. Then, in a few minutes of well-rehearsed teamwork, they prepare to get some more information about the magnificent cats. The animal is fitted with a radio collar, which will automatically drop off after one year. It has a hair sample taken for DNA, plus a photograph of its jaws, which will allow the scientists to judge its general health and age. Shortly afterwards, the team tests the result with the loop antenna. Results from other collared cats have already provided data in the last few months and reveal surprising information. The most impressive results that we've been seeing due to the satellite tags that we're putting on the, on the, on the Jaguars is the, the movements. They've been really unexpected, not what we had expected at all. Especially the females, they seem to be sticking really close to the rivers, as you can see here. In comparison, the males, they're using a whole different area. They're going deep into the forest and coming back around. What the implications for conservation mean is that one, that jaguars need large expanses of territory. It's something very important. If you got a, one male using 40,000 hectares, then you mean you're going to need thousands, hundreds of thousands of hectares, if not millions, to conserve an entire population. Also, the river seems to be quite important for the jaguars, especially the females. This will probably bring humans and jaguars into, into a high degree of conflict in the future. Reconciling the interests of man and nature will clearly be a huge and continuing challenge, and not only in Amazonia. Even today, there are immense parts of the eastern Amazon where there is already no room at all for the jaguar and many other rainforest creatures. Other illegal activities threaten the entire ecosystem. Rangers from both the Brazilian and the Argentine sitches, logging is a major threat to the nature of Amazonia.
Since 1996, almost 100,000 square kilometers of rainforest have been burned in Amazonia. The fires destroy the lungs of the earth. Furthermore, Amazonia plays a vital role for the water balance and the climate all around the globe, and thus for all of mankind. More than 2,000 sawmills in Brazil work with rainforest wood, many of them illegally. What is tragic is that only 1 to 2 percent of this magnificent hardwood will be used. For decades, there's been a Wild West attitude to the forest, but since 2005, the Brazilian government has tried very hard to find and close illegal sawmills. On this occasion, the big fish have already gone. There are only a handful of workers left who toil for little money for the wood mafia. Most probably the officers will not get any useful information about the organization here. Each sawmill brings destruction, not only through the logging, but also because of the streets leading to it and the space used for the mill and the machines. Since 2005, the Brazilian government has reduced deforestation by a third. For officer in charge, Olithio Leo Marquez, it's always a tragedy when a rich, vibrant area of forest is reduced to dust. Always when arriving in this area, there is a profound sadness to see an area, a region so rich and with such a beautiful forest, battered in this manner. It's absolutely shattering. A sadness for anyone looking at a scene like this. Out of the shadow of darkness comes hope. Scientific research suggests the rainforest potential to heal itself is greater than night new life continues to dawn. The Kaima nesting mound contains a clutch of... But tonight, a special prowl is on. Under constant monitoring, endangered Kaima. The fate of rainforest life beyond the boundaries of national parks remains to be seen. One thing is certain, without them... On the plains of Kenya, rangers face similar problems. Here, poachers that catch antelopes to sell for bushmeat often use wire snares, but other animals equally fall victim to these cruel traps. Like this female rhino, Five snares have wounded the animal badly. More than two hours, a team of Kenya's wildlife service operate to get rid of the wires. The anaesthetized animal needs to be cooled regularly to avoid overheating. <laughs> Rescue missions like this are extremely expensive, but nowadays every rhino is precious. Their numbers have dropped alarmingly. They are hunted for their horn that is used in Asia for traditional Chinese medicine. <laughs> Even after decades of hunting, Africa's black rhino population in the 1960s was still around 50,000 animals. Now, less than 5,000 remain, although most of them live in protected areas and are guarded 24-7. Many rangers lost their lives, killed by heavily armed poachers. The female rhino was lucky. She was not shot, 
but only injured. In her special rescue camp, she will have time to recover before she will be set free again. <laughs> The rangers of Kenya's wildlife service will keep an eye on her when she cautiously returns to the wild. Hmm? Okay. Okay. Rhinos are still critically endangered, but without the help of conservationists, they probably would have been extinct. His mission forces him into parts of the wilderness, so cut off, he must take everything he needs with him. By measuring the depth of snow through the year, Brian can record how the glacier changes size, building a pic. Brian estimates that the Southern Alps have lost a third of their permanent snow and ice over the last 40 years. These findings correlate to the results of scientists working on glaciers around the world. An example that things can change for the better can be found in the Harz Mountains in the heart of Germany, where, as from the year 2000, lynx have been reintroduced into nature after they were extinct. No one knows exactly how many lynx are roaming in the forest here today? Probably a few dozen. Hardly anyone sees them. But someone is on the case, using telemetrical antennas. Ranger Ola Anders has supervised the lynx project from the beginning. He's fascinated by the big cats. Scientist Ulrike Müller wants to learn more about the life of this secretive hunter. Hello. Hello. So this is the Harz, this green area here. Yeah. That's right, this big rounded forest area. It's about two and a half thousand square kilometers. How many lynx do you have tagged right now? Well, altogether we've observed eight animals. And here we're looking at the home range of five telemetrically tagged animals. This is from the Lynx M4, for example, who travels over about 150 square kilometers. He's somewhere close by, and I'm actually looking for him today. Male Lynx M4 is transmitting from around the Brocken mountain. At the beginning, Oleanders had hardly any information. Chance sightings and photographs helped him. The picture showed him which lynx had his territory, where and what was his favorite prey. Some lynx were earmarked. Only Anders observed that the cats would soon have litters. Since 2002, lynx have been born in the hearts every year. The exact number, though, is unknown. One of the females is F2. F2 is often passing the territory of the male M4, since Orle caught her and fitted her with a radio collar. He doesn't like doing it, but it's necessary to learn more about the elusive cats. Via telemetrical signals, Ole learns how the lynx are moving around. But M4 has been silent for days. The male was often around a lynx enclosure, but there's no signal from M4 here either. From here, we can get an idea of a large area of his home range. Still no sign. But if we don't have any single here, then he's probably on the other side of the Brocken. Will they find M4?
1818, the last lynx was shot in the Hartz Mountains. Now every individual is a living proof that the forests have still enough to offer for the silent hunters. Finally, M4 is back in the neighborhood. The National Park is starting an intensive screening of the tagged lynx. Several signals a day from the same animal in the same place are known as a cluster. Most likely, the lynx returns every now and then to a kill. Ole makes sure that the cat is not around to avoid any disturbance. We found it, a roebok. We pretty much all eaten up. That's a typical case. This is a kill where he's taken absolutely everything that's useful to him. Mm. We'll now take the exact position so that we don't just have a cluster position, but the precise location of the kill. Mm. Without the transmitters, it was previously hardly possible to find out where the big cats raise their offspring. With female F2, all has been successful. She's hidden her cubs beneath a rocky overhang, far from any path. A cuddly bundle of lynx. Everything happens swiftly and quietly, so that the animal is disturbed no longer than necessary. The young lynx will be measured and weighed. <laughs> Today, everyone's smiling, but back then, they were under a lot of pressure. A final drop of blood for the scientists. Hardly before the little one can register what's happening, he's back under the overhang. A bearer of hope for the future. southern Sweden lies the island of Öland. Recently, a problem has developed regarding its moose. That's why moose expert Fredrik Steinbacher was called. He supervises a monitoring program on the island to find a reason for the increasing numbers of dead moose calves. This cow already has a collar and a name, Cementa. Frederick wants to exchange it. The batteries of the transmitter are low. The first dart hits its target. Part of the team State veterinarian Jonas Malmstein. He examines the cow for diseases. For Frederick, his job is all but routine. It's a great bonus. It's a blessing to be working so close to animals as I have the chance to do, especially with the king of the forest. The moose is stunningly noble and beautiful, but you should not only have respect for the moose when working. Animals are animals, and you have to remember that. So you must respect the situation. Moose can be very protective creatures. It's an amazing animal to work with. Large, dignified, respectable, and beautiful. Truly amazing. They are magnificent and calm. They mean so much to Scandinavia. Always have and always will. You're so good, Samantha. Yeah, you're a sweetheart. Two months later in May, spring has arrived on the island of Uland. The first moose calves are born. Shortly after birth, 
The mother licks the calf clean. It's a crucial time for the mothers. They have to find lots of food to provide enough milk for their offspring. Not all of them succeed. They should be on the other side. They only find a dead calf. It's sad. We know it can happen, especially here on Erland, but it's sad. Right away, they start their forensic work. Veterinarian Jonas discovers another clue. You can see here on the feet, there's like a thin membrane that wears off when the calf has been up walking. So this calf was born alive and then died within a day. Let's weigh it. Exactly 10 kilograms. The cause of death is not visible at first sight. Results will later confirm that, neglected by its mother, the calf starved to death within hours of birth. On Öland, these connections arrive more clearly than on the mainland. Out here, the animals simply can't escape. So there are two leads that the team has to follow. Who is the culprit, the scarcity of food, or the climate change? Some evidence is still missing. Jonas needs to search for more calves. She doesn't really know we're there. But we have to be really careful, because the wind might shift a little bit. And if we break a small twig, she will know right away and then we may not be sure where she is exactly and won't find her location. So we have to be really, really careful over the last 20 or 40 meters. Finally, the cow makes a dash through the woods and Jonas and Kent have to hurry to catch the calf in time. To their great joy, there are actually two calves. It's twins. She seems to be a good mother. They were just lying here in their calving place, and they were born yesterday. We've marked and weighed them. Now we'll release them and head out quickly. They leave swiftly, as the little ones would certainly try to follow them. The calves quickly assign and accept new foster parents. Moose on Öland may only be able to survive with food directly administered by humans. Yes, it depends on in what way we want to manage game populations, or moose population in this case. The first question is, how much should we really interfere with nature? Should we do a lot of feeding of game species? It depends on what aim we have for our game populations and how we want to manage them. Mankind is most likely co-responsible for the situation of the moose on Öland. Whatever happens with these animals is in their hands now. Frederick and his team will continue to collect evidence to finally solve it completely. The mystery of Öland. Conservationists in Florida face completely different problems. The Crystal River is one of the most beautiful riverscapes, a paradise, not only for birds. That's the beauty. This whole area is here to protect manatees, but it also affords environment for all kinds of wildlife. Biologist and vet Bob Bondi knows Florida's manatees like no one else. 
He's on his way to an animal reported to be wounded. Fortunately, it's tagged with a transmitter. So there's some site fidelity patterns that we've learned that manatees have directly from putting radio tags on them and observing these migrations that they make. It's very important because they use the corridors that are out there, the waterways that we use for our same boats. So that interaction between boats and manatees is a serious problem. So here's the entrance to the sanctuary where we might be able to see the manatee. Oh, yeah, here it is. Oh, yeah. Beneath the buoy is a resting manatee with an unusual wound. We were surprised when we saw this manatee, and it looked like it had a wound inflicted by a propeller. But at close examination, we determined that this was actually a shark bite. This animal had been attacked out in the marine system before it had come into Crystal River. But there's very little evidence that manatees are actually preyed upon by um, sharks and successful or by alligators. It does happen, but it's a pretty rare occurrence, fortunately for the manatees. The biggest threat are boats, however. Generally, you know, no manatee is exempt from getting scars from boats that they interact with out in the environment. And as you can see, Many of these manatees, if not all of them, have some evidence of their interaction with boats. Another problem only occurs in winter. The manatees can't swim to the open sea to feed on plants as the water is too cold for them. The hot springs at the Crystal River are one of the most important wintering sites for manatees. But here, food is scarce and some risk hypothermia just to get a bite. A rescue team led by scientist Andrew Garrett is aiming to capture a dangerously underheated animal. One of our colleagues found a, a manatee that she said looks very thin and, and uh, cold stress. So it's an animal that's been suffering from the cold that we need to bring into captivity and get treatment for. The difficulty is going to be trying to get the net around the manatee and then pulling it back into the boat uh, without it getting away. But first, the creature has to be found. A colleague signals the exact position to Garrett. The net can be brought out. OK, get the ball for Mike. Get the ball for Mike. Come on. Everything must happen quickly so the animal does not escape. And stay your pile further forward if you can on the other side of that pile. Only with combined strength can the several hundred kilogram animal be heaved on board. All right, slack tail, slack tail, slack tail. All right, ready? One, two, three, pull. Got a fish, too. Let's get that fish out of there. Big jack. Oh. Here you go. The manatee is in a critical condition. It requires urgent medical attention. Veterinary surgeon Dr. Murphy from the Manatee Clinic at Lowry Park Zoo, Tampa, is already waiting for the exhausted creature. He begins first aid on the patient. She's in really bad shape. It's a cold stress animal that's got a lot of infection in her tail, in her pecs. She's been like that for a while. After Dr. Murphy has given her antibiotics, the underheated animal urgently needs warmth. Her slow metabolism can only generate a meager body temperature. No, she's in critical shape. She'll, she, if, she, if she survives the first uh, few days, then we might be able to upgrade her chances of, of making it. But right now, uh, she's really teetering on the edge, and she could easily die on us in the next 30 minutes or could die on us by tomorrow morning. There is, however, a glimmer of hope. The rescued animal still has a healthy appetite. Whether she will make it or not, is unsure. But a couple of days later, there's good news. The hypothermia victim is on the road to recovery. She seems to be a winner. I think right now it's just going to, we're going to have to see if she's going to lose some of her flippers or she's going to lose some of her tail because of uh, the severe cold injury to those, those tissues. So we're just going to have to see. 
and another patient will be released into the wild today. Thanks to the dedication of the whole team that fights for the protection of Florida's manatees, these extraordinary creatures will have a chance to survive against all odds. Germany's Lake District. Almost 2,000 of them makes this region so unique. In 1990, the Müritz National Park was established. 322 square kilometers of nature now lie under rigorous preservation, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Fred Bollmann grew up in the Müritz region and knows the lake landscape by the back of his hand. This time, the nature fan and former park ranger is out to repair an osprey's eerie. To do this, he has to climb 25 meters up an old pine tree. In recent years, the migratory birds have brooded here, but a winter storm has damaged their nest. It must be built in early spring, before the ospreys return from Africa. It's not an easy job, but Fred Bollmann gets on with it on behalf of his favorite bird of prey. He wants to help maintain the osprey population here in the Müritz region. This is my home. I think that's why I do this. I don't do it because I have to, but out of conviction, and it's fun. Everyone should contribute something, and I enjoy climbing and building nests like this. Once the birds move in, so to speak, I only have to collect the rent, but of course I don't. This is all the payment I need, and I get a lot out of it. On a calm April morning, the waiting is over. The ospreys have arrived. The female is already waiting at the eyrie, while the male brings a bridal gift. This certainly comes before any building materials. She seems to be impressed. And now the preparation of the nest for the upcoming season can begin. Fred is eager to help his ospreys whenever he can. I find these birds fascinating. Their hunting methods, their behavior, how they look. I'm a big fan. Back at the nest, the fish are already longingly awaited. Several times a day, the father provides fish for the chicks, while mum takes care of the feeding. The offspring are now three weeks old, but they still can't break up their food themselves. So far, Breeding season has gone without a hitch for parents and chicks. These raptors are a sign that the wildlife of the Mecklenburg Lake District and the Müritz is intact in many places. But Fred Bonner also looks into the future of the region with concern.
Wild habitats have to be created. They're being damaged here. On the one hand, it's intensive agriculture which is impacting on the habitats of many species. And on the other, of course, intensive forestry. So I want to do my bit to prevent some of the effects. I have lots of plans. The key thing is to actually do something. Soon, the young ospreys won't be able to enjoy being fed and have to learn to feed for themselves. Thanks to Fred Bormann, they have a good chance of making it. The Janga Sangha National Park in the Central African Republic, home to forest elephants and 3,000 lowland gorillas. Until recently, little was known about these imposing creatures. Biologist Angelique Todd has, for the first time, succeeded in gaining the trust of a family of lowland gorillas, allowing us an intimate insight into their secret lives. The leader of the troop is Makumba, an impressive silverback weighing almost 200 kilograms with a little authority problem. At the moment, he's calling for the, the females to come back. The most important thing for them is to eat. And so they come when they want to, and he can ask all he likes, but they come when they want to. So. Females in charge, yeah. Macumba's troop has six males and five females. And just like humans, they all have individual characters, as Angelique has discovered. How much longer will he be able to command the respect of his troop? How long will the young gorillas follow him? Certainly I care a lot about his family and, and that's what keeps me here. And so I can't imagine if he goes for good, you know. It will be terrible. It will be devastating, really. I maybe avoid thinking about it a little bit. Now he's 32 years old, a respectable age for a gorilla. It's getting towards, as I would say, like retirement age in humans, maybe. How long that can go on, I don't know. Makumba is always going to be very special to me because he was the first group I habituated. There's always that first love that somebody special. And you can never go backwards, can you? While the females are off searching for food, the youngsters are often cared for by their father, a babysitting silverback. Camp by Huku. Today, Angelique is completely at home here, but in the beginning, it was an alien world for her. I really just came for six months, and I actually was quite um, worried, as one is when, you, when you're going into some sort of kind of an unknown territory, you know, it's a bit scary. I think uh, I heard a story about some kind of tapeworm or something like this, and it didn't sound very nice. And also with insects, you know, there's a lot of you know creepy crawlies and stuff, but you get used to that very quickly to the point where you know you don't take a sip of your tea without looking in the cup first. You know, I'll do that in England, even though we haven't really got any insects. You know. What I like about living here is that you're more in touch with real life. I think in Europe we've become a bit distant about what life is really about. And yes, it's about survival, and if you're successful in surviving, you know, and that makes you happy, and then it's just as simple as that. Life in the jungle, though, is not always easy. Tonight, forest elephants have made their way into the camp to rearrange the kitchen. But the hassles of the night are quickly forgotten when the sun rises over the few clearings in the endless forests. These magical places attract forest animals out into the open. The forest elephants that meanwhile left the camp are part of a large group. They congregate every morning in the clearing. It's not the water, of which there is plenty they're coming for. It's the mud, rich in minerals. Elephants need them to neutralize plant toxins. It's a kind of antidote. Local people call this clearing Jangabai, V2. 
village of the elephants. At least once a week, Angelique undertakes the two-hour drive to the next village, Bayanga. More than half the villagers suffer from malnutrition. This is bad news for the gorillas, too. Here in Bayanga, the people would never try to sell gorilla meat. Angelique is respected and often their last resort in case of serious illness or need. Nevertheless, Angelique's presence alone will not be enough in the long run. I think the bushmeat trade is increasing, it's becoming more commercialised, and um, they're basically teams, gangs of heavily armed poachers that could potentially just wipe out all the wildlife in the area. Up to 6,000 apes are killed for bushmeat every year. Even worse is the situation for the forest elephants, as the greed for their tusks is still unbroken. This footage shows the open trade with ebony as it used to be, less than a decade ago. Today, this is illegal. But the business is far from being stopped, as the amount of confiscated ebony shows. But there is hope, as China, the biggest market, just banned the trade with the elephant tusks. Whether this will change the situation in the Congo Basin remains unclear. The status of the gorillas, though, is critical. All four subspecies are threatened by extinction. Angelique hopes that the involvement of local people will enable her to protect the big apes. Tracking gorillas in the rainforest is not easy and will be impossible without the help of the local Baka people anyway. From what I've picked up over the years, I mean, the, the obvious things are the, the food traces that the gorillas have left behind. Whereas I'm uh, in the forest working off a 2D map to do with the gorilla traces, um, theirs is a 3D map and it's complete, absolutely complete. They have a sense of awareness in the forest we've lost, I would say. They hear every single sound, they see every single thing. So when they're looking, for instance, for knuckle prints, they'll just pick up one random leaf and there'll be something underneath it. And i constantly amazed. So the biker are the most important thing. Without them, we couldn't do it at all. And they're fantastic people too, really fantastic people to work with. Angelique will remain with Makumba until the end, side by side with the king of the jungle. Look, the baby star. Every new baby gorilla is a sign of hope, but Angelique knows there is still much to do. We really need to make to make this whole sort of tourism program work. We need to. Um, be sustainable and we need to be generating money that, that is put back into conservation. As far as my job is concerned, I mean, that's definitely our vision. And it's getting there. The programme is really, really working. And it makes you feel, it makes you feel good. <laughs>